evening we're going to be reading from Psalm 40, the whole chapter. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on the rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord, my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Where do I speak to you and tell you of your deeds? It would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. Hey. For my ears you have opened, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, Here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not steal my lips, Lord. As you know, I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and in your saving will. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs on they are more than the hairs on my head, and my heart fails within me. Be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. May all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May all those who say to me, aha, aha, be upheld in their own shame. But, but may all who speak you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. But as for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. Thank you, brother, so much. And in Psalm 40, we certainly have a powerful psalm. Uh, of David, one that in many ways is uh, beneficial uh, for us in our study and understanding of uh, the Scripture, and also uh, when, we think, when we think about our own prayer life and our own uh, worship and approaching uh, of God our Father. We're going to study this psalm uh, this evening, and we're going to break it up uh, into five major points. We're going to look at the praise, verses 1 through 5. We're going to then consider the prophecy, verses 6 through 8, the preaching, verses 9 through 10, the praying, verses 11 through 16, and finally the perspective, verses 17 through 18. So let's begin by contemplating and considering here the praise of verses 1 through 5. Notice that uh, the psalmist is, is writing and describing of the worthiness of God's praise and is acknowledging the fact in the very beginning that God even hears and acknowledges his prayer. Uh, sometimes I think we take prayer for granted. I think we are... Uh, <coughs> Uh, to the uh, mindset and of the view that uh, the Lord should uh, simply uh, hear our prayer because we desire to seek after Him and to speak to Him, uh, and it should just be something that happens. But sometimes we also fail to recognize and remember that it is by His very graciousness that we are even able to pray and that we are uh, capable of being able to pet petition Him uh, and really uh, come to Him with forcefulness uh, in our prayer. Uh, the Hebrews writer explains in Hebrews chapter 4, in Hebrews chapter 4, uh, starting there in, in verse, uh, verse uh, 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And we're able to do that because of the sacrifice of his son uh, that enables us and opens a door for us, he being our advocate that allows us to approach him in prayer, but we can do so boldly, and we ought to recognize and reflect, and David, of course, is here upon the praiseworthiness of God, given that he indeed hears our prayers. But upon hearing our prayers, he likewise is capable and desires to heighten us. He, he, he heightens us, he elevates us, he esteems us, and puts us on a much higher plane than on the plane that we would be in and of ourselves. Notice there in verse 2, he brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Without God, we are completely and totally lost. We are helpless. 
We are without hope, as Paul will explain to the brethren in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, he explains there uh, regarding the hopelessness that had existed uh, concerning the uh, Gentile people uh, who were amongst those folks in Ephesus in verse 12. He says that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. It is only because of God and it is only because of His blessings uh, that we have the goodness that we have, that we're able to enjoy the blessings that we have. Uh, the world sometimes jokes about and thinks it's funny that uh, life without God or a life or an eternity uh, in hell is, is in many ways maybe just a party. It's just an opportunity then to no longer have the rules that, that God has uh, forced upon us. Uh, we no longer have to even reflect or think about uh, sinfulness or wickedness, but can just live for ourselves. And that really is a, is a party and one to be enjoyed. But we fail to think of and, and reflect upon when folks think that way that everything that is good comes from God. Ephesians, uh, excuse me, James chapter 1 and verse 17, James writes, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Everything that is good, everything that is excellent, every bit of understanding and ability that we have to stand and to march ourselves forward, physically, emotionally, mentally, of course spiritually, is because of God and because of His graciousness. And so the psalmist here is acknowledging that in his praise to God, acknowledging that number one, he hears Him, number two, he heightens Him, but number three, he exemplifies the way in which the psalmist himself should be living. Notice there in verse 4, Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. In other words, the one who is likewise living likened unto the Father, he is the one that is going to be blessed. He is not respecting the proud. He is not concerned or uh, in any way being discriminatory toward those who are uh, you know, maybe heightened or elevated in this life but rather is being likened unto God and is willing and desiring uh, that any and all might have a right relationship with Him. James writes of partiality in James chapter 2. James chapter 2, beginning there in verse 1, he writes, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool, are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which He hath promised to them that love Him? Indeed, our Father has exemplified for us the way in which we should treat and care for those around us, regardless of their status in uh, this life, regardless of whether or not they are well off, or uh, whether or not they are proud or haughty. Uh, but instead, those generally who are more lowly, those who are maybe struggling uh, physically in this life are much more inclined to be rich in faith because they recognize this physical world doesn't really have much to offer and is not going to sustain them eternally. But yet spiritually speaking, the richness of the gospel may indeed be a great blessing that they're willing to contemplate. Uh, Jesus teaches us the need to uh, follow the example of our Father in Matthew chapter 5, beginning there in verse 43. He, he uh, says there, as Matthew records, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemies. Uh, and thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven 
is perfect. God is worthy of praise because He hears me. He's worthy of praise because He heightens me. But He's also worthy of praise because He has set the example for me that I likewise should be a, a man that is seeking to be blessed, who is making the Lord his trust and respecting not the proud, nor turning aside uh, to lies. And so finally then we see in verse 5, He's worthy of praise because He has earned it. Because He has earned our praise. Many, O Lord my God, are Thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are toward us. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee, if I would declare and speak of them. They are more than can be numbered. Folks, the next time we are challenged, and obviously the psalmist here in this chapter is indeed challenged, as we'll notice in a few minutes, desiring deliverance, uh, calling out and beckoning, uh, in, in a precatory nature. In other words, that God might respond to his requests and bring upon uh, the justice due to those who are bringing about persecution upon his life. Reflecting upon the works of God and the praiseworthiness that he deserved and that he has earned because of those works will aid us in being able to find relief and some kind of comfort in those challenging times. Uh, if you began to write down the amount and the depth of the works of God, uh, you and I both would be here all evening uh, into the early wee hours of the morning and still would not have exhausted the list. And that's what the psalmist is explaining here. Hey, uh, thy wonderful works, there's so many, they can't even be numbered. I can't even begin to count them. Thou art worthy of so much Praise, And so we see the praise there in verses 1 through 5. Let's look at the prophecy here, verses 6 through 8. Verses 6 through 8. Uh, notice there that the psalmist is explaining, hey, uh, when it comes to sacrifices, when it comes to offerings, that's not what it is that you desire. You're not desiring these sacrifices. You're not desiring offerings. Instead, you're <coughs> desiring, and, and what it is that you seek is that the volume, the, the will of yours is within my heart, that it is literally a part of who I am. Uh, and so we see that this principle is throughout the Scriptures. Notice, for example, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse uh, 22, we see that Samuel will be explaining here to Saul uh, regarding his own attempts to justify his disobedient behavior, and he's explaining that, hey, I didn't obey what the Lord had commanded me to do, verses 1 through 3 of the chapter, I I've kept certain animals, I I've kept certain things, I haven't destroyed everything, but you know what, we're going to sacrifice those to God, and Samuel's explaining here to Saul in verse 22, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of ram. See, sometimes we as humans get this idea that, you know what, I'm just going to uh, go through some sacrifices in my life. I'm going to put a few checks in a few boxes here and there. I I'm not really going to be meditating upon and striving to live in the will of God, but I'm going to make sure I get these visible items done when it comes to sacrifices, and God will be pleased with me. And that's essentially what Saul is trying to explain here. And Samuel uh, rebukes him for this thought. says, no, no, God doesn't care about your sacrifices. He doesn't care about your offerings. He cares about your submission. He cares about your obedience. He cares about your allegiance. And folks, if we're submissive unto the will of God, if we're obedient unto the will of God, then are we going to sacrifice unto God? Absolutely. Are we going to give offerings unto God? Absolutely. But we cannot replace one for the other. And if the first is right, that is our obedience, our allegiance to God, then the sacrifices, the offerings indeed, uh, they will follow. This, again, principle is not a new one, and it's not uh, e exclusive there to 1 Samuel chapter 15. We also see it uh, in other accounts throughout the Scriptures. Take, for example, in the Minor Prophets. We look and see in Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6, beginning there in verse 6. We've referred to this on a few occasions together, uh, but it applies here as well. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord... And bow myself before the high God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Hey, what is it that I can actually do to please God? It just doesn't seem like he's ever going to be satisfied with me. 
to the Old Testament people of God. I'm doing all these things for you, God. What else do you really want from me? I, how much do I really have to give? And so Micah explains there in verse 8, He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. If you do that, you're going to sacrifice to Him in an acceptable way. But Israel was certainly in a state of mind where they were trying to just give God these sacrifices and engage in certain areas and elements of worship, but their heart, their mind, their actual lifestyle and what they care about, their desire is far from God. They didn't really want anything uh, to do with Him. And so we see then this principle in verses 6 through 8 of Psalm 40 uh, throughout the Scripture. But let's also consider the prophet. Let's consider the one who is writing this prophecy, that is David. Uh, it's not unique here that David would say something along the lines, again, he is being inspired, but thy law is within my heart. Hey, I I'm not going to be focused in on these physical attributes, but I'm trying to cleanse myself internally. That's not new to this prophet, to David. Notice in Psalm 119, Psalm 119, uh, beginning there in verse 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Uh, now, brethren, you might think, you know, how, how often do we need to really refer to this verse? I mean, I don't know if you all recall, I think we had, it was probably a few months ago, uh, a sermon where I handed out a worksheet. Uh, I think we still have those worksheets on our mirrors in our house. And it had, right here, Psalm 119, verse 11, then it had several areas that maybe we tend to struggle with in life. Uh, and those verses that we could memorize and hide within our hearts so that we can then uh, have the strength and the power through the gospel, through the word of God, to overcome those sins. And, and you might think, we really need to constantly refer to this. Well, brethren, there have been times when I have spoken with people uh, who are uh, daily involved in the work of the church. Daily. Uh, who have actually consulted me on certain occasions. Hey, I'm struggling with certain sin. I, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with this, I'm struggling with that. And I know the Bible says I shouldn't do it. But where? Where does the Bible say that? Well, you know, I think, you know, there's these verses. Where? Well, what's the verse? Well, uh, you know, well, have you hid that verse in your heart? <laughs> Have you actually made that verse a part of who you are? Meditated upon it? Dwelt upon it? Used it and leveraged it when you're in the midst of that moment of temptation? To then say, no, I have a choice here. I don't have to do this. And folks, sometimes I'll tell you what we do. We generalize things. We generalize things. And that concept and that mindset is absolutely crept into the church. Gone are the days, as some of our preachers have said. Gone are the days when a man will stand in a suit and preach book, chapter, verse. Shame on those brethren that think that. Shame on those brethren. Folks, it is only through the Word of God that we are ever going to have the strength that we require to make changes in our life. And when we just begin to generalize things, when we just begin to start referring to things and just kind of, you know, well, I know it's in there kind of things, we're not hiding the Word of God. Hiding it in our heart. It's not valuable to us. It's not becoming a part of who I am. And David understood this. I notice as well in the same exact chapter, verse 97, Oh, how I love thy law, it is my meditation. All the day. You're struggling with your boss. You're struggling with your family. You're struggling with your day-to-day uh, -day life and various challenges that you're facing. Meditate on the Word of God. Meditate on the Word of God. Notice as well, verse 105. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Do you feel blind spiritually? Do you feel uh, conflicted spiritually? In the dark, spiritually? Folks, you don't have to feel that way. You don't have to be in that kind of state. The Word of God provides you a light. And it provides us the answers that we require in order to have eternal life. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Now, uh, just a side note here. That doesn't mean that the Word of God is going to answer my every little whim and question that I have on all kinds of random thoughts and curiosities. 
I have met some good intended brethren who have spent a lot of time wanting to argue, debate, making certain things their hobby horse almost in every Bible class on matters that, folks, the Bible just doesn't give us the answer to. Well, we're not in the dark spiritually, folks. God has not given us that because we don't require it in order to live a godly life and in order to go to heaven. So we just need to move on and say, well, if it's not in there, I'll just keep going. And I'll study on the things that He has provided me. We see in this prophecy that the prophet himself understood this very principle. But let's also consider the potentate. Let's consider who it is that this prophecy is directed toward. It is toward the potentate. It is toward the Christ. Notice with me in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 4 through 13. Hebrews chapter 10 beginning there in verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore when he cometh into the world he said sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not but a body hast thou prepared for me and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure then said I lo I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will O God. Above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not neither hast pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering, oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Jesus Christ is the offering. He indeed is the sacrifice, but he is also at the same time the king, uh, the potentate, and he is at the same time the very uh, priest. Look with me in Zechariah chapter 6. Zechariah chapter 6, and notice beginning here, actually it's only just one verse, Zechariah chapter 6 and verse uh, 13. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the counsel of his peace shall be between them both. Think about that for a second. Jesus was both sacrifice, he likewise is priest, and he is likewise a king. Notice in Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 4, For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Well, how is it then that Jesus is priest? Well, he sat down at the right hand of of God, as Mark explains at the end of Mark chapter 16, he is the king, he is the potentate, and he is also the priest, and he is reigning, and in that position, in those positions, uh, in heaven above. Uh, he is the high priest having passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, uh, who uh, was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 15. So we see in this psalm uh, the praise, verses 1 through 5, the prophecy, verses 6 through 8. Let's look here at the preaching, verses 9 and 10. The psalmist here is explaining that the righteousness is being preached amongst the congregation or amongst the assembly. He's not refrained his lips. The Lord knows this. He's not hid the righteousness of God within his heart, but rather he's declaring it. He's declaring the faithfulness of God. He's declaring the salvation of God. He's not concealing His loving kindness. He's not concealing the truth of God from the assembly or from the congregation. Preaching uh, is a result of hiding the Word of God in one's heart. Uh, folks, when we value, when we leverage on a daily basis the Word of God, out of our love for Him and for His Word. Folks, it's not something that can be contained within us. Uh, it's going to be spoken of. It's going to be taught through our actions, yes, but also through our words. Uh, Bible class, yes. From the pulpit, yes. But also in our daily life. Within our homes. Within our neighborhoods. Within our workplaces. 
uh, let me tell you a little bit about who it is that I live for. Uh, and folks, um, sometimes I think that we get this idea in this society that we need to just be quiet. And we don't get to say anything. Uh, let me tell you, homosexuals are saying stuff to further their agenda of homosexuality. All right? Uh, denominationalists are saying stuff to further their denominational doctrines. Uh, those that are of other religious beliefs are saying things. Uh, they're, they're not ashamed. They're not afraid to say why it is they do what they do. And you know what? Society has done a whole lot to protect them to be able to say those things. And I think sometimes we get this idea that, you know what? Uh, I, I shouldn't be saying anything here. I just need to keep my mouth shut. I don't need to tell someone the, the real reason as to why I'm living. I don't need to actually explain to them what it is that makes me tip. I need to just try to avoid saying anything that, you know, it might offend somebody or it might make me look funny. Uh, well, folks, we're going to put ourselves in a difficult pickle in that, in that situation. Because the Word of God is hid in our hearts so that it might be used. And if we don't use it, then we begin to allow ourselves to go into a death spiral. Well, all of a sudden, we're not using the Word of God. We're not speaking of the Word of God. We're not applying the Word of God. And the next thing we know, we're not very interested in studying the Word of God, hiding it in our heart any longer. But the same spiral, the same snowball can occur in the other direction. The more and more we fill our heart with God's Word, the more and more we are provoked, emboldened, <coughs> courageous to say something. The preaching of God's Word, it is to be heralded. It is to be absolutely proclaimed. Now, Jesus speaks of this in Matthew chapter 10, it's recorded. Matthew chapter 10, notice in verse 27, what I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. Preach it upon the housetops. Jesus doesn't say, hey, you heard this stuff, now go hide somewhere. That's not what he says. You heard this, now go declare it. Herald it. It should be spoken of. Notice as well, it is not to be hid from those that are around us. In other words, as we proclaim, as we uh, uh, acknowledge more and more and, and engage in this flywheel, if you will, filling ourselves with the Word of God and seeing the results of it, we then are emboldened to bring about fruitfulness and then proclaim that fruitfulness to others. Notice here in Luke chapter 15, beginning there in verse 4, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I have lost. Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner. That repentant. Folks, our Lord expects us to campaign, expects us to proclaim, expects us to go out and make public the work and the fruitfulness of that work as we engage in it. We see here in the preaching that it is to be heralded and it indeed is not to be hid from those that are around us. Let's look then at the praying, verses 11 through 16, the praying. Notice here in this context, it indeed is precatory. I imagine at this point, hopefully with the amount of psalms that we've studied together, you're familiar with this term and what it, what it refers to. It is making requests unto God and oftentimes 
from a spiritual perspective, it is making requests that are specific regarding a vengeance, regarding the desire that God take vengeance on those uh, that, are, that are mistreating uh, them. Notice 